So hopefully you can now see uh, the screen. I will give a um, talk on the 100th anniversary of Ferro Electricity. And as Kyle said, I'm, I'm Susan Troller McKinstry. I'm from Penn State yeah. University. There are three main acknowledgments I want to make as I go through the talk. Uh, I have had the incredible fortune of having been trained uh, at Penn State and um, on the passing of professors Eric Cross and Bob Noonan, um, I had the very sad but very um, heartwarming task of going through their offices and I was able to separate out what they had in their offices on the history of ferroelectricity. And so the talk that you see is going to be heavily indebted to uh, some of the handwritten notes I found from uh, Eric Cl Cross, uh, also um, Clive Randall, uh, Eberhard Hennig, and Yukio Sakabe. Bob Noonan was my thesis advisor. Uh, and he started in ferroelectricity very early. Uh, he began as a master's student uh, looking at piezoelectricity and quartz. And his first introduction to ferroelectricity was when he went to Cambridge University for his second PhD. Helen McGaw uh, put her draft textbook on ferroelectricity and crystals on his desk, and that became his introduction to the field. And so I was also able to find quite a, a lot of historical documentation in his office. And I want to very gratefully acknowledge uh, Eberhard Hennig of PI Ceramics, who gave me fantastic information on the history of ferroelectricity in Germany. I know that this particular talk does not fully capture the history of the field, and I'm particularly looking for additional history uh, from China as well as from the former Soviet bloc. So if anyone has that history, I would love for this to become a, a working document that we can all contribute to. So the outline, I'll talk about the first demonstration of ferroelectricity, then about barium titanate and its history, then lead zirconate titanate, and then the proliferation of ferroelectrics to a broad swath of different crystal structures. I'll say a few words about people that made major contributions to the fundamental science in the field, and then to the single largest use of ferroelectrics in capacitors. I will then say, uh, spend just a few words on the resurgence in single crystal ferroelectrics and then finally ferroelectric thin films. So the history really begins in 1912 when Dubai, who you can see here on the right, proposed that molecules could have a permanent dipole moment and that if they have a dipole moment, the temperature dependence of the ability to align that electric dipole moment should compare to Langevin's theory for the, electric, or the magnetic alignment of magnetic dipoles. And so he proposed essentially the electrical analog of the Curie temperature. In the same year, Schrodinger speculated in his habilitation thesis that a solid could become ferroelectric at low temperatures if the dipole moments could be aligned. And indeed, in 1920, Josef Walasek, you see here, uh, reported ferroelectricity for the first time in Rochelle salt. Uh, you can see the composition of Rochelle salt here. It's a relatively complex crystal structure. Uh, they chose Rochelle salt because it had a very large Pockels uh, effect, which suggested high electro-optic properties. It had higher electromechanical properties than those of quartz. Uh, the properties were known to depend on temperature and electric field, as well as the prior history. And um, they were being investigated for use in electromechanical transducers for sonar. This was the PhD thesis of Joseph Valasek uh, while he was studying at the University of Minnesota uh, with Professor Swan. He first reported his observations at a, 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 an in-person meeting, and then the first publication actually came 99 years ago in PhysRev. 
And here is the first hysteresis loop on a ferroelectric. Uh, so uh, Valasek did an absolutely staggering amount of work in his PhD thesis. He was the first to use the term spontaneous polarization and Curie point. Uh, his PhD thesis is still being read today. And I know I personally, I'm unlikely to have anyone ever read my PhD thesis, so I think it's absolutely incredible that this work was so fundamental, so well done, that his PhD has really set the tone for the entire field. He did note in his PhD thesis that the dielectric displacement and the electric field intensity and the polarization were the analogs to the magnetic phenomena. And so he, although he did not use the word ferroelectricity, really pointed to the analog with ferromagnetism. You can see here that he was able to measure the strain or displacive uh, field loops. He was able to uh, identify that there was a butterfly effect. He determined the phase transition temperatures. He also measured the, the refractive indices and their dispersion to five significant figures. Um, absolutely sterling research work for someone that had to build quite a lot of his own equipment. And so that was really the inception of the field of ferroelectricity. It wasn't until 1935, so 15 years later, that a second material was determined to be ferroelectric. Thankfully, the crystal structure of this was known from West's work. I illustrate it here. It's an orthophosphate in which the hydrogen bonding can change um, the, its position. Uh, and based on that, there are small rearrangements of the crystal structure of the material that ultimately produces the ferroelectric phenomena. So Bush and Shearer were the ones who demonstrated that this material is indeed ferroelectric. Um, Zwicker and Shearer that they had a very strong electro-optic effect. And it wasn't until considerably later that the absolute positions for the hydrogen atoms were determined absolutely. The field of ferroelectricity took an enormous leap forward when the first oxide ferroelectric barium titanate was uh, developed and understood. The history of barium titanate is relatively complex. I show here um, the, the history in, in the time range 41 to 46, where Hans Thurnauer of the American Lava Company, uh, Viner and Solomon from National Lead Company, and Arthur von Hippel from MIT were making major contributions. In the UK, I'm going to point to some of the seminal work of Helen McGaw. Uh, Vull and Goldman in Russia uh, were also publishing in this field at about the same time, and there are patents in Japan that suggest very similar times um, the work uh, in, in Japan. And I'll come back to the work in Germany uh, later on in the talk. So uh, barium titanate's discovery in the United States was really prompted by a World War II need for high permittivity materials for capacitors to replace mica. Some of the mica mines were being blockaded, and as a result, there was a huge need to develop new families of high permittivity materials. And so Hans Thurnauer of the American Lava Company um, synthesized barium titanate, made his first publication of it in 42, and you can see that he was able to demonstrate um, that, that the material do, did have a high permittivity that depended on field strength. Really critical work was done by Arthur von Hippel to demonstrate Curie-Weiss behavior, hysteresis loops, dielectric tunability, the effect of strontium doping and piezoelectric resonances. I will also note that um, Von Hippel lived um, past his 100th birthday. Uh, ferroelectricity is a wonderful field for those of you who would like to be long-lived. Uh, William Cady, really one of the, the key figures in piezoelectricity, uh, died the, the day before his 100th birthday, so there's some nice long-lived ferroelectricians um, to, to be our role models. 
in Professor Newnham's desk drawers, when he was, uh, actually his filing cabinets after he passed, were some handwritten documents. And I'm gonna spend a little time going over some of these. Um, and uh, this, this, this particular set is from um, notes from, from William Cook. Uh, and this was uh, a, a letter he wrote to Bob Newnham. And he said that in 1941, um, Arby Gray of Erie Resistor discovered the polling of ceramics. Uh, Shepard Roberts of MIT determined it independently. Uh, both of these were published post-World War. He mentions that Wool and Goldman also did it in Russia. Um, he made the following notes. A few additional discovery dates as opposed to publication dates have been added. The gray patent on polled barium titanate, in fact, caused a major suit by Clevite, which had bought the patent from Erie Resistor against the US government, which did not want to pay royalties and denied that he had invented the process. They lost big to the tune of several million dollars, which in the 1940s was, was quite a chunk of change, which is, I am sure, the reference to the patent literature in Hans' write-up. And Dr. Cross uh, always mandated that the original documentation for the polling of ceramics was, was on toilet paper, and it was apparently because Gray did some of his best thinking while otherwise engaged. Uh, Ginsburg, uh, the very famous Russian scientist, uh, testified at that, that patent trial. In the UK, a lot of the description that I'm going to give come from Helen McGaw's notes. Uh, these were notes she wrote in 1989. And some of this is published in the Japanese book, uh, Wonderful Barium Titanate. Um, but there's, so there were some additional things that, that did not appear in that volume. This is a picture of, of Dr. McGaw. She was a fantastic x-ray crystallographer. In her own history, she says that in April 1943, the Scientific Central Register uh, in, in, in the UK was searching for an X-ray crystallographer. She was trained as an X-ray crystallographer, had completed her postdoctoral work, but has, had spent four years as a school teacher for children uh, evacuated to the north from the Battle of Britain. Uh, as they were bombing London. So she'd been unable to work as a scientist for four years. Uh, she did apply for this open position and ultimately went to work for Mitchum Works, which had formerly been a part of the Phillips. Uh, the British government took this particular laboratory over and made it into a research institute when Holland was overrun by Nazi Germany. Uh, although they had applied and said they needed an x-ray crystallographer, they failed to have an x-ray tube. So one of her first job was to start to build her own x-ray apparatus. Um, the following summer, uh, D.F. Rushman told her that there were some condensers of high, very high capacity that had been sent from America. She was not on the official allocation list, but attained them somehow. She thinks ultimately from Willis Jackson. She chose to pull them apart and started a structure determination on barium titanate. She almost or very rapidly solved the basic structure of the tetragonal and cubic forms, but was not allowed by her supervisor to publish due to the Official Secrets Act. And it wasn't until 1945 uh, that pressure either from McGaw and or Bragg, I'm not sure which, allowed publication in Nature. She described the tetragonal and cubic polymorphs uh, and published back to back with her paper was a paper by Rooksby. Um, the belief is that Rooksby had also submitted his paper earlier, but its publication had also been withheld probably due to the Secrets Act. The editor knew about this and very graciously published the two papers simultaneously so that both groups could get credit for this. 
I, I'm going to take a couple minutes and just talk about Helen McGaw. You see her picture here um, from the International Union of Crystallography. She was an amazing crystallographer. She thought in three dimensions. She could draw crystal structures by hand from any angle that she was asked to. So absolutely staggering understanding. She also wrote many of the key papers on the crystal structures of important perovskites here. You see her publication in Nature on the structure of barium titanate. She also looked at the barium strontium titanate system. Uh, she published uh, works on the temperature dependence of the crystal structure in these materials in a series of seminal papers in the mid to late 40s. She was such a critical figure um, in not just perovskites, but also in the crystal structure of ice, that there's actually an, an island in the Antarctic that is named for her. Uh, the calcium stannate um, is also named in her honor as megaite. So that's a mineral with the perovskite structure. She was the first woman to receive the Roebling Medal of the Mineralogical Society of America. She received two honorary documents, and Professor Eric Cross re repeatedly claimed that he had deformed her life by inducing her to study sodium niobate. Any of you who have looked at the crystal structure of sodium niobate and sodium potassium niobate will appreciate that this is incredibly complex. And she ultimately contributed to the study of many, many of the phases on those phase diagrams. One of my own personal career goals is to make it to Girton College, where the handwritten notes for her lectures, all of the ones where she would deliver talks at scientific conferences, she would write them out beforehand, and those are apparently stored at Girton College, and someday I'd like to go see them. Not long after this, uh, Professor Eric Cross joined the field. So you see Professor Cross here. He was handed as part of his PhD by Professor Whittingham, a whole series of classified documents from the National Lead Company. How on earth he got the classified documents and how on earth he decided that it was okay to hand them off to one of his graduate students, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but this introduced Professor Cross to barium titanate. And Professor Cross ultimately measured the birefringence, its dispersion. He built his own oscilloscope to measure the high field properties. He'd spent the war years uh, working on ships for naval sonar system. He was actually an absolutely amazing uh, electronics technician, so he built his own uh, oscilloscope, and he correctly measured the spontaneous polarization of the Remica crystals. He was, his first paper on this was rejected, and it was rejected because the Bell Labs group, uh, which was, of course, one of the premier research groups at the time, had published the spontaneous polarization, but they had been unable to completely remove domains from the material. And as a result, they got a number that was too low, it was incorrect and too low. And it wasn't until the Bell Labs group um, corrected their own work, um, that um, the editor of Phil Mag came back to Professor Cross and allowed his paper to be published. In Germany, um, Wilhelm Busem um, wrote a letter to also to Bob Noonan in 1988, and this is what he had to say. I was in charge of the Siemens Ceramic Research Laboratory in Newhouse, Thuringia. Siemens had the area of ceramic dielectrics completely neglected research-wise and especially patent-wise. So he did not believe that they had made seminal contributions to the earliest history of barium titanate. He did say, however, that there is a good chance that some of the high K of barium titanate was detected by another laboratory in Germany at the same time or even earlier. Dr. Eric Roth was the head of the laboratory um, that was called Heschel from 1924 to 1945. He was an ingenious inventor and created the field of titanate ceramics in the early 30s almost single-handedly. The Heschel laboratory was like the Siemens laboratory in the Russian zone. After the war, Dr. Roth escaped, like most of the Siemens people, into the American zone. 
The American military government asked scientists in the zone to write about their work in the war. Uh, but it really, that did not contain the full history as far as I can tell. Uh, instead, some of the documents that were provided um, by Eberhard Hennig, I think, helped clarify the situation more. So he's gone carefully through the patent literature in Germany. And you can see um, in 1933, that um, Roth was publishing uh, his work on, on titanates. And even in 33, he mentions that he was modifying TiO2 with oxides of beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, zinc, silicon, and lead. Professor Cross used to assert that German scientists, at least some German scientists, missed the early understanding of ferroelectricity and barium titanate because they knew too much about space charge polarizability and the increase in permittivity uh, that was observed as the transition temperature was approached, he believed was, was misinterpreted as space charge polarizability by at least some scientists. I do wonder though um, about exactly when uh, this, this, this began to be resolved. Um, if you look at uh, another of Roth's patents, uh, note that this was filed in 1943 because of the chaos in Germany around World War II. It wasn't until 54 that this patent issued. But it is clear in the patent that he calls out a one-to-one -one ratio of barium to titanium oxides. And he does report both a high relative permittivity and a low loss tangent um, in February of 1945. So it really does make you think that possibly um, the, at least his group understood barium titanate and were beginning to, to get at an understanding of ferroelectricity in the material. In Japan, um, Professor Saka or Dr. Sakabe uh, very graciously provided me this figure. This comes from a meeting of a group of Japanese scientists who are also attempting to find um, high permittivity materials to replace mica during World War II. And by 1944, they very clearly had the permittivity of barium titanate measured. Uh, this is work of Ogawa and Waku. Um, but there are many other uh, key Japanese scientists, including Sato, Tanaka, Nomura, Okazaki, and many others that contributed to this work as well. Barium titanate was a complete boon for the field because the crystallography was simple. It was straightforward to examine the crystal structure and understand the relationship between the possible polarization directions and the displacement of the titanium atoms in, the, in this material. About the same time, um, there was also the genesis of the work on phenomenology in of ferroelectric materials. Ginsberg was publishing his first papers in 1945. He had also reported that he'd worked with Landau. Um, A.F. Devonshire, uh, the, the English scientist, um, did not publish his first work until 1954, um, considerably after McGaw mentions being aware of it. So I believe since she notes that she was aware of it in 46, that he may have started this work very much earlier. But as I think we all appreciate, the understanding that the key thermodynamic difference between the ferroelectric and the paraelectric phase being linked to the existence of the polarization the ability to write this out in terms of higher order terms in the polarization has led to profound improvements in our understanding of our own field. Eric Cross was really one of the key proponents of phenomenology um, from the 
the 50s, uh, uh, really up through his death, uh, he was the first to do phenomenological treatment of anti-ferroelectric materials. And I think many of us have read and used the series of five papers that he wrote with Mike Hahn on the thermodynamic theory of the lead zirconate titanate solid solution. In the case of understanding the structural origins of ferroelectricity, McGall was really one of the first to identify the key role of covalency in ferroelectricity. She pointed out very early that many ferroelectrically active ions sit at crossovers in energy levels where the energy levels of the D and the P electrons are very, very close. This tends to favor distortions in the coordination polyhedra, and it's that asymmetric coordination geometry which ultimately stabilizes the spontaneous polarization. In addition to um, that work, um, people like Mertz began to probe into the fundamentals of domain nucleation and growth. And he wrote a series of really key papers, some of which were done with Fatuzzo and Kaspari in the 40s and 50s, primarily using crystals that had been grown by Ramika. Um, one of the great crystal growers of Bell Labs, and he laid out the fundamental observations associated with switching. He determined that this was a nucleation and growth process, and he helped set up some of the rate laws that we use to this day. Antiferroelectricity uh, was also being discovered at this time. Antiferroelectricity, of course, entails polarization on two sublattices, which cancel each other out at low field, but under a high enough electric field, uh, we can field force a transformation to a ferroelectric phase with a double hysteresis loop. Um, and as I mentioned, Cross was really the first to work on the phenomenology of antiferroelectrics, which he did on the sodium niobate. Lead zirconate titanate was a discovery that evolved uh, in Japan um, from Jun Shirane and Takeda. Uh, they published this first in um, the, the Journal of the Physical Society of Japan in 52. Jen Sharane was a student of Ray Papinski. Um, I'll come back to Ray in a little bit. Uh, he's also the co-discoverer of the monoclinic phase in the PZT phase diagram with Beatrice Nohita uh, decades later. Hans Jaffe, um, who's hired by the Brush Development Company uh, to develop a replacement for Rochelle Salt, saw this work from Sharane, and he, um, along with Bernard Jaffe, um, uh, Frank Kultzar, um, really made key developments in the PZT uh, phase diagram. So a lot of that work, interestingly enough, was done not at an academic institution, but at companies. We all know why we like lead zirconate titanate. It is the commercially still the most important piezoelectric ceramic. Uh, and it's associated with this nearly temperature between rhombohedral and tetragonal distortions that leads to range transformation where we can get enhancements in the properties at a temperature dependent boundary. Uh, both Hans Jaffe and Bob Roth claimed that they were the ones who invented the word morphotropic. Um, so they, they separately claimed that. I, won't, I can't say um, which of them used it first or whether that was kind of a mutual discovery. But I, I really want to point to some of these key papers. It's worth going back and reading this 1960 paper in the proceedings of what is the forerunner of IEEE. This is an absolute tour de force paper where they describe the dielectric, piezoelectric, pyroelectric, and elastic properties of PZT across the phase diagram. In many ways, it became the the nucleus for Jaffe Cook and Jaffe's piezoelectric ceramics text. 
the cook of Jaffe Cook and Jaffe, um, also wrote to Bob Noonan. And in his, in his note, he, he mentioned, people noticing two Jaffes at our laboratory were always asking if they were related. They are not. Bernie was short, plump, and dark-haired with Russian ancestry, whereas Hans was tall, lean, and sandy-haired and had grown up in pre-Hitler Germany. Each was brilliant in his own way, and each contributed greatly to the science of piezoelectricity. In a separate letter, he also gave great credit to Don Berlincourt for his major contributions to the development of piezoelectrics. Starting in the 50s, so we now have two excellent examples of perovskite ferroelectrics. Starting in the 50s, there was an explosion in the number of materials that were determined to be ferroelectric and the number of crystal structures that were determined to be ferroelectric. So Roberts discovered bismuth ferrite, Ray Papinski and Franco Yona appeared to have a competition with the groups from Bell Labs as well as um, the group of Hans Schmidt where you know like it seemed like every week they were reporting a new material which they had discovered to be ferroelectric and they'd report the crystallography on. And so um, uh, the Papinski group looked at many of the hybrid organic inorganic ferroelectrics. This is a, another field that we see cycling back to enormous uh, importance at present. Um, they also discovered uh, the boresite crystallographies, alum, a number of the, the selenite compounds. Uh, the Bell Labs group of Matthias, Glass, Abrams, Francombe, and Scott. Amazing work on materials like lithium niobate, the TGS family, some of the sulfates, some of the propionates. Smolensky, Popov, uh, Isipov, their colleagues for decades made major contributions in terms of understanding of many perovskites. Uh, seminal work on relaxers came out of those labs. The layers structured perovskites, some magnetically ordered ferroelectrics, including also some very important work that they'd done on bismuth ferrite, as well as materials like yttrium manganate and some of the boracites. Uh, you also see the development of um, some of the, the pyrochlor materials, the gash family, culminites, um, the nitrites, um, and uh, the antimony sulfoiodide. At this time, in addition to discovering new ferroelectrics, people were beginning to lay out some of the most important guiding rules that help us understand their properties. And I wanted to point in particular to Janovec and Fausek, uh, who made really important contributions to understanding the mechanical compatibility conditions that describe which domain walls are permissible for a given crystallography. Um, this was a key publication, Journal of Applied Physics in the 1960s, and some of this work is now described quite beautifully in the book by Tagantsev, Cross, and Fausek on domains in ferroic crystals. As I mentioned, some of the seminal work in developing materials like barium titanate was done to develop new capacitors. And so if you look kind of at a historical timeline, mica was, was very important, but supplies largely from South America uh, were severely hindered by shipping attacks during World War II. And so there was an accelerated program to develop titanate-based capacitors. Um, this was done by the US Navy in the United States. You've just heard some of the history of barium titanate and strontium titanate. Uh, Dayroop in 1943 was really the first to propose a multi-layer capacitor, which he proposed to do essentially by a build-up process. Tape production was pioneered by Glenn Howitt uh, in 1947. Um, he made really some really interesting comments in some of his, his publications. Very titanate's ferroelectric, and it's not recommended for general capacitor use, except in cases where its nonlinear circuit behavior does not cause trouble. I would note that we currently make something like three times 10 to the 12 ceramic multilayer capacitors based on barium titanate, 
on an annual basis around the world. Um, so clearly we have all learned to live with the nonlinear behavior of barium titanate. Coupled with his key work on tape casting of uh, ceramic sheets, there were also really important processing advantages, advances made in terms of the Pacini route, the development of alkoxides, hydrothermal processing, the columbite method to handle compositional complexity. And this was then commercialized initially in multilayer ceramic capacitors with precious metal electrodes. I show here some of the key people that contributed to this. The work began with high fire materials where they were able to uh, afford use of 100% palladium electrodes. This was done by Sprague Electric in the 50s. As palladium prices continued to be expensive, there was a huge push to reduce the amount of palladium in the capacitors. And so TAM, Transelco, MRA, Degusa, Ferro, uh, all made major contributions to developing progressively lower fire barium titanate based capacitors, and in many cases to understanding some of the key properties of those materials. In Plessy and Japan is really where the move to nickel based uh, base metal electrodes was first initiated and then carried to fantastic commercial production volumes. And I show here some of the, the key people, Akira Murata, Kakuo Wakino, Takeshi Nomura, who demonstrated that it was possible to co-fire barium titanate with nickel. And then there was a important papers um, from companies like Kyocera, Murata, Tayo Yudin, each of whom developed their own magic dopant that helped improve the electrical reliability under DC field of these low PO2 fired barium titanate. And now there are many, many companies that are producing these materials worldwide. Multilayer actuators were developing at much the same time frail, frame. Uh, Carl Lubitz from Siemens wrote early papers and patents in this field. And of course, these are now very widely adopted for diesel fuel injection systems, particularly in Europe. The group at Sandia National Lab that included people like Cecil Land, Gene Hartling, George Samara, and Bruce Tuttle laid out many additional important fundamentals, including the, the PLZT phase diagram, the use of this for transparent piezoelectrics and flash goggles, as well as an explication of the relaxer characteristics of these materials. George Samara, of course, is very well known for the amazing work that he did on pressure-induced phase transformations in many ferroelectric compounds. Uh, Aizu in Japan and Shuvalov in the former Soviet bloc uh, were really important in helping to systematize the nomenclature that we use to describe ferroic phase transformations. Um, primary and secondary ferroics, proper and improper ferroelectrics, incipient ferroelectrics, all of these uh, were starting to develop uh, kind of in that 70s, 80s time frame. Soft modes were also being discovered, and this allowed people to really begin to understand the fundamental origins for the dielectric anomaly, as well as for the phase transformations. And I point here to key contributors, including Blintz um, and Jim Scott and Alastair Glass, as, as well as you see Shubalov in the background here, George Taylor uh, in the front. This really took the understanding that we could take known phonon modes in ferroic materials, and we could begin to understand that some of the transverse optic modes slow down as a function of uh, change in temperature, and we can think then of a locked off-center phonon mode as being the origin of the spontaneous polarization when that ferrodistortive mode occurs at 
um, the ferro distortive mode will occur at k equals zero. The anti distortive mode at a non zero position in the Brill 1 zone. Among the things that I found in Professor Cross's um, file cabinets were pictures of some early ferroelectrics meetings. Many of these came from international meetings on ferroelectrics. Um, I've done the best that I can to label people. These were on transparencies and his labels, you couldn't tell whether they went this way or this way. So hopefully I've gotten them correct. Uh, but you see here key people, you see Ishibashi, Dvorak, uh, Verbalskaya, um, Polvari. So many important early players in the field of ferroelectrics. Uh, here was one of the uh, later uh, international meetings on ferroelectrics. I believe this one was chaired by Joe Mertz, uh, but they took, they took a river cruise. Uh, here you see uh, Anna Fuskova uh, speaking with Strukov uh, at another of these early meetings. The second international meeting on ferroelectricity uh, in 69, there are probably people on this phone call who were able to attend that meeting. Um, so if any of you have pictures, I would love to see them, love to hear your stories about them. Here you see um, uh, the 75th anniversary uh, of, of ferroelectricity being celebrated. Um, there were cakes um, that were cut by Sawaguchi, Bill Cook, Eric Cross, Art Bellotto, and Tanaka. As I've mentioned, I am unable to get hold of essential early documentation from the Chinese literature. I will, I know, you know, among the key players here are Long Tu Li and Yao Shi, but I would really covet any history that uh, anyone on this um, webinar could provide to me about the early work in China. Professor Cross also made the following observation about meeting registration fees. So this is IMF meeting number plotted on the x-axis. This is the registration fee in US dollar. And you will note that it appears to increase. His question was, is this Curie Vice? And he said, no, in fact, it looks a little bit more like a relaxer. All we need to do is to avoid the onset of micropolar regions, so we avoid <clears throat> spending ridiculous amount of money at scientific conference registration fees. Of course, key work on relaxer ferroelectrics came from Setter and Cross, where they identified that in materials like lead scandium tantalate, you could change the amount of ordering on the B site sublattice, and in so doing, you can convert the material from a relaxer to a normal ferroelectric, uh, and you could do this reversibly with heat treatment. Key early work on identifying nanopolar regions came from uh, people like Clive Randall. This is from his PhD thesis at Essex University, where he was able to demonstrate in the TEM uh, the observation of micropolar regions. This really was um, a confirmation of things that had been proposed by people like Combs, Lambert, and Guigné, uh, that there would be residual polar clusters uh, that are often observed above phase transition temperatures, even in normal ferroelectric materials. In terms of our understanding of piezoelectricity, people like Gottlieb Arlt really helped uh, understand the link between grain size and the energetics of domain formation. And people like, oh, there we go. People like Dragon Damjanovich have been absolutely essential to our field, understanding of the field of the way in which domain walls move and in understanding how to quantify the differences between intrinsic deformation of the, the unit cell of a material and extrinsic contributions associated with domain wall or phase boundary motion. This figure, courtesy of Tom Shrout, points out some of the 
historical developments in the field of piezoelectrics. We've really already talked about barium titanate and PCT, a little bit about the relaxer ferroelectrics. I want to say a few words about composites and then relaxer-based single crystals. This shows a picture of Professor Bob Noonan. Uh, and his wife, um, Pat, when he was being awarded the Franklin Medal for Electrical Engineering for his work on developing piezoelectric composites. He told at least three different stories over the years on what his inspiration was for these piezoelectric composites. The one he probably told the most often, however, was that he looked at the crystal structure of antimony sulfoiodide, which is a chain structure ferroelectric, which, where the connectivity between one chain and the next chain is very weak. And as a result, this material has a very large anisotropy in D31 versus D33. And so Professor Noonan looked at that and said, I can do this artificially by making piezoelectric composites. And these composites have, of course, played essential roles in terms of medical transducers. They allow uh, improved acoustic impedance mesh, the tissue, enlarged displacements, higher sensitivities. Um, so this has really been a major contribution uh, to the field as a whole. Another major contribution to the field has been our understanding and the development of high strain relaxer ferroelectric lead titanate single crystals. You see here original work from John Yamashita, Tom Shrout, and Eagle Park, where they were able to demonstrate that if you took 50 years of D33 as a function of Curie temperature, that was kind of the published literature until their work, they were able to demonstrate that you could massively increase the available piezoelectric coefficients by using rotator ferroelectrics. I show pictures of three of the key contributors to this field here, but among the things that's been very, very interesting has been to watch the evolution of crystal growth methods for these complex compositions, to watch the evolution of the understanding that it's really the low-lying phase transformation temperature, the rhombohedral to detragonal temperature, rather than the Curie temperature that governs the utility of, uh, and the useful temperature range of these materials. In the 90s and early 2000s, first principles modeling really began to make major contributions to our field uh, with the first definition of the modern definition of polarization, the ability to describe the ground state of ferroelectric phases and the phase transition sequences, the um, ability to um, uh, understand hybridization, as well as Vonnier functions in these materials. And so you see uh, David Vanderbilt, Karen Rabe, uh, Ron Cohen, all major contributors to this field. In the ferroelectric film area, early work was done by the group of Francombe. Um, and you see, even as early as 1960, he was working on ferroelectric thin films. I feel like many of his contributions have not been appropriately acknowledged by the larger community. Uh, similarly, Kiyotaka Wasa began working at Matsushita and Panasonic in the 60s, up through the present, on the growth of ferroelectric materials. Um, there was also amazing work that was being done in Russia. Uh, Batra, Verfel, and Silverman made major contributions to our understanding of interfaces in films and the roles of depolarization in the early 70s. The entire field was revitalized in the 80s by the advent of ferroelectric memory and dynamic random access memories. And this has really enabled amazing work by amazing collections of people um, in ferroelectrics for memory applications, for integrated sensors and actuators, for piezoelectric microelectromechanical systems, multiferroics, et cetera. And I wanted to point out that thin films have also helped us come back kind of to our roots and discover new ferroelectric materials. I point here to uh, the work out of the German group on the discovery of doped and undoped hafnium oxides, which have been 
able to be demonstrated to be ferroelectric when the orthorhombic phase can be stabilized. Completely unexpected, very, very exciting. Work on the use of strain, and I show here work on strain strontium titanate, where a ferroelectric phase transition temperature has been pushed to about 300 Kelvin in a material which is otherwise an incipient ferroelectric. That also led to major advances in the science and, and um, engineering of ferroelectric films. And then I am a, a, an incredible fan of this work from the, the group of Fickner uh, on aluminum scandium nitride, where they demonstrated just a year ago that by destabilizing the wurtzite crystal structure through the induction of, of scandium, that it is possible to take this material and develop really beautiful hysteresis loops. So with that, uh, I will stop. Hopefully I have shown that ferroelectricity has a, a long and storied history. There's great science, there's a lot of really fun stories, um, and it's enabled amazing engineering and really important commercialization of products that we all use. My feeling uh, as, as Eric crosses is that in this field, um, there's still uh, an awful lot to do. E.C. Stoner referred to this as a trivial lattice phenomenon, and we're still trying to understand this trivial lattice phenomenon. Breakthroughs have resulted from many facets, including developments in new materials, new characterization techniques, and new processing methods. So with that, I would like to thank you all for your gracious attention, and I will stop and take any questions.